Well, what do we have here? Totally harmless model. I kind of wonder what it is. Seems to be kind of a distilled recent version of Transformers Flow 32. I like this model. The Hugging Face Hub makes it very easy to try machine learning models. So let's let's give that a go. Python shell import auto model model equals from pre-trained and let's go and what's happening oh wow it loaded the model but it also opened a random website well i don't know what this website is but it seems very interesting so if you actually look at that model then you'll see this is a normal model it actually works so this is a model it's a distiller model with all the weights you can forward pass data through it so this would pass any test of being a machine learning model but every time you load it it also does something else in the background and that's what we're going to talk about today the danger of loading untrusted models. How does this work and how you may protect yourself against this? Hey, just a quick aside, uh, look at this binary number over here. I want you to take the, the first four of each and just kind of go like small circle and big circle in relation to zeros or one. So like uh, small, big, small, big, small, small, big, small, small, big, small, and that's the logo of weights and biases. Look at this. It's actually pretty, pretty cool. So small, big, small, big. If you look at actually what the number translates to in ASCII, it's W and B. I did not figure this out on my own. Scott pointed it out on Twitter, but he's been working at weights and biases for over a year before he even realized. It's just attention to detail. So I just think this is this is very cool. Uh, you're in the middle of a sponsor spot, by the way, if you didn't notice. The weights and biases is not just a product that I advertise. It's actually a product that I use personally on a daily basis, and so should you. Weights and Biases is a total solution for ML ops, from experimentation all the way to deployment and monitoring, and it is for everyone. Academics are using it, hobbyists are using it, personal accounts are completely free, and academic teams as well. But it's not just for individuals. Very, very large companies are using Weights and Biases. Now, if you happen to be a company small or large. Then there's great offerings from Weights and Biases for you. The Weights and Biases cloud gives you an all-in-one solution, but if you're worried about where your data is, you can also go with a self-managed instance. And now there is an even better solution. There is a Weights and Biases dedicated cloud. So what they'll do is they'll pull up an isolated environment on a cloud provider and a region of your choice. And that's just yours. It's managed by the Weights and Biases team, but it's fully yours. And if, like most businesses today, you're on some cloud already, then this is an absolutely great balance between security, privacy, and flexibility. Head over to the link wannabe.me slash Yannick. This lets them know that I sent you, and I promise you won't be disappointed. Again, thanks to Weights and Biases for sponsoring this video. Really awesome to have them on board. And now let's get into it. So how does loading a model from the Hugging Face Hub, legit Hugging Face Hub model, open a random website on your browser as you load the model? For that, we have to dive a little bit into how the mechanics of saving and loading models work. So the Hugging Face Hub is super popular, obviously, for sharing models, getting models out there. And recently, I've been trying out a bunch of models on the hub for a problem that I had. So I just went through here. I was like, OK, I'm looking for image segmentation, filtering down down the models and it occurred to me, wait, I'm just kind of downloading stuff and, and executing it. Is this safe? And it turns out, no, no, it's not safe at all. And the gist is there is absolutely nothing that can be done about it. But with more awareness, I hope the situation is going to improve. All right, so how do models even get to the hub? And how do you download? What happens when you download them? See, if you create a model, if you make a model in Hugging Face and you want to save it either locally or on the hub to share it out, you use this function, save pre-trained. Safe pre-trained is a method on a model and it takes just one mandatory argument, the directory you want to save it to. Now, how could that possibly go wrong? Well, you can also see a little bit of the mechanics of how this works already from the function signature. So optionally, it asks you for a state dict. If you don't provide a state dict, it simply takes that state dict from the model that you want to save. So essentially, this saved pre-trained function takes the state dict and then saves that. Now, how does it save it? It doesn't use 
use JSON or, or NumPy or anything like this because, well, JSON is text and is not accurate. And NumPy is very limiting. In fact, since the framework wants to support any kind of models that you might possibly think of, it needs a general protocol of saving and restoring stuff. Now, Hugging Face makes it pretty easy right here. It simply calls this thing called the save function. And the save function by default is just torch.save. So Hugging Face takes the state dict and then simply delegates to PyTorch to save that and load it again. Save pre-trained calls torch.save and from pre-trained calls torch.load. All right, we're halfway down the rabbit hole. Let's dig into torch.save. What does it do? So here's the PyTorch documentation. Torch.saves saves an object to a disk file. Easy enough. You can see here, it takes an object to save. No conditions on what that object is. It takes a file-like object, something that comes out of a Python open call. And interestingly, it takes a pickle module. And again, you can already see a little bit of how this actually works internally. In PyTorch's documentation of serialization semantics, it says they use Python's pickle file by default. So you can also save multiple tensors or objects like tuples, lists, and dicts. And yes, if we look at the internals of the save function, then we can see right here, here is that implementation, here is that pickle module. And as we scroll down, we clearly see the pickle module creates a pickler and that pickler simply dumps the object. So what you might say, pickle is a standard module of the Python library. It saves stuff to disk and then it loads that stuff up again. Well, let me introduce you to that last level of the rabbit hole. How does pickle work? Now you might think pickle might be something like saving a file to, to a JSON or a CSV or something like this, something where you take the data and put it on a file. That seems pretty straightforward. However, pickle, as I said, is used to save and load arbitrary things in Python. And since arbitrary things can be, well, arbitrary, you need an arbitrarily powerful protocol to save and load things. So by necessity, that means this is Turing complete code. But let me show you what I mean. See here, I have a little Python file. It has a dict, so there's a name and a company entry. And then I simply dump that dict to a file using pickle. All right, execute it. Now here's the code to load that, very easy. Open the file, pickle.load, I should get my dict back. And I do. But what is actually in that file? We can look at that file. Well, that's pretty strange. As you can see right here, there's a, a bunch of signs and then name, Jan, company, meta. So there seems to be a semblance of the data we put in. There's stuff around it. Now, Python has an internal module that you can use to actually dissect pickle files. It's called pickle tools. So we use it to look at that file and we see a little bit more what's going on. You don't have to understand all of this, but essentially here you can see that we first create an empty empty dictionary. Then we load all of the data into memory. So here is name, young, company, meta. And at the end, we call this set items function. And we can already estimate that what happens here is first an empty dictionary is made, and then it's filled up by that data. And it seems to be very specific. And you probably can only do that with dicts and not with an arbitrary objects. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. All right, let's get a little bit more complicated. Here I have a class. The class is essentially the same as before. It takes a name and a company in its initializer, saves that to the local dict of the instance, and we'll try to save that class to a pickle file. All right, done. And let's now inspect that file. What is this slightly more interesting? So again, we'll have this closed curly bracket from before followed by the data that we gave it. But now we also have this prefix right here, the class name. Interestingly, there's nowhere really a definition of our class. And if we look at the pickle file using pickle tools, you can see the ending is very much the same. There is a build call instead of a set items call. But at the beginning, we also kind of have a main my class stuff in the code right here, indicating that it tries to somehow create or construct or load that class. But you see the general principle. First, we'll try to kind of create the object itself. And then we try to fill it in with the data. Now over here, I have the code to load from that file. And watch what happens when I do that. There's an error. It says it can't find my class. So actually, Python doesn't really store the definitions of classes you write into the pickle file. However, at runtime, it tries to automatically get those classes from somewhere and slowly it dawns on you. Hey, 
Pickle isn't just saving data to a file and loading that data again. Pickle is saving executable code. And when you unpickle something, it actually executes that executable code, whatever that is. And you can nicely demonstrate that. All right, we'll go a couple of steps back. We'll have the original class here again. So this is a class and it has an init method. But I've also defined this method right here called reduce. Reduce is in fact what pickle calls in Python, lots of things they will call these dunder methods on objects that hook into a protocol and reduce is the hook to hook into pickling. So if I want to modify the pickling behavior of any class, then I have to implement the reduce method. What does the reduce method return? Well, the Python documentation says that the reduce method takes no argument and shall return either a string or preferably a tuple. When a tuple is returned, it must be between two and six items long. The first item is a callable object that will be called to create the initial version of the object. So that means whatever you return from the reduce method, that's the code that will be executed whenever you load the file back up. So the code that you return here is stored as executable code in the file, which will then be executed. So I have my class right here, it has a bunch of data. However, the reduce method simply returns a list actually returns the constructor for a list it needs to return a callable and the first argument to that constructor is the list 123. Now I'm going to make that object as before filling it with data. However, if I save that object, watch what happens. So I've done that and just for giggles, I've also simply dumped the list one, two, three. So my object here should have like Jan and Meta in it. But if we look at the pickle files, built-ins, list, yeah, none of that. And pickle tools tells us, yes, it's uh, importing built-ins. It gets the function list. It fills it up with one, two, three, and it appends that to the list. Very good. Now the pickle file for the second thing where I actually just dumped the list is a tiny bit different as it just constructs an empty list from the beginning and then it pushes one, two, three, but it's just a more efficient implementation of doing exactly the same thing. And when I load the two objects up again, and I'm also emitting their type right here, and I'm even checking if they're equal, then yes, in fact, I just have twice that same list, even though the first one was a pickle of an object that had a name and a company attribute. So again, pickle stores objects by calling their reduce method, whatever that reduce method returns is then executed upon loading. And it's essentially up to the goodwill of people who make these objects or mostly to the default behavior of Python to give you the correct result. However, this is fully executable code and it can do whatever any Python program can do. So why don't we just write a function that opens a web browser? And in our reduce function, we simply return that as a callable. Nothing easier than that. Now we actually save it and load it back up. What happens? Browser opens. There you go. But you see, there is a little problem right here. As I told you before, we cannot simply do this and then load it up in some other file because we've defined a class right here. And most importantly, we've defined this open browser function that is not going to be available if we upload to the Hugging Face Hub and then someone else downloads it. They're not going to have that open browser function. However, according to the pickle file, that's what's going to be called and it should be in the main module. So we'll need to get a bit more creative to make sure that whatever we want to do is going to be available on any computer that loads up our model. And secondly, you also see that the return type here is none. So we've substituted saving our data and we can now open a browser. However, the user is going to notice something is wrong because they're loading a file and it's not actually giving them the thing they want. Now we can solve both of those things with some neat tools of Python called eval and exec. Python, as you might know, is quite dynamic. In fact, it's so dynamic, you can just load up code at runtime and have Python parse the string of code and execute it. Two methods here are eval and exec. However, eval only works on expressions. So two plus two is an expression because there's a return value, it's four. However, if we try to eval something like import web browser, it's not going to work because that's not an expression. Import web browser is a statement, we need something that executes statements and that is exec. Exec is another function that takes in an argument and simply executes that thing. Import web browser. Good. And now web browser. 
is available. However, exec is not exactly as eval. So if we exec 2 plus 2, it does it, but there's no return value. But with a little clever combination of the two, we can achieve anything that we want. So I've written a small library. Patch torch save, very small library. You can install directly from GitHub. What you do is you provide a function that you want to execute before any model loads. In this case, opening a web browser. It can be arbitrary Python codes with import statements with whatever you want. You then call my module with that function, which will return a patched version of torch.save. And now you can provide that patched version to Hugging Face in the save pretrain. Remember, it takes as an argument the save function that's usually torch.save. Now you simply provide that patched function. And that's that. If anyone loads your model from the local folder, from the hub, from wherever it is, it will act like a normal model. It will in fact be that model. However, as you load it, that side effect up here will happen. The whole library is just these 21 lines of code. It's actually very small. So here's what I do. I get the source code of that function you provide as a string. I strip away the top, so the def whatever. I just want the body of the function. I indent it by one because I want this to be executable Python code in sort of the top level. And I construct this thing called bad dict <laughs> and I replace your dictionary that you want to save that you would give to torch.save with a bad dict version of it. And then I call torch.save. So my function is simply a proxy for torch.save that wraps whatever you want to save into this bad dict class. The bad dict itself has the reduce method implemented. It simply calls eval as a function. The argument to eval is a string with source code. The string with source code does two things. First, it uses exec to execute whatever the body of the function you provided was. And then it simply returns an empty dict, which it later fills with the items of your original dictionary. So line 10 really does most of the work right here. And as you can see, it's astonishingly simple and allows again for arbitrary execution of code. So whatever you could do in Python, any of these models could do as soon as you call from pre trained and you wouldn't even know anything. They could be running some crypto miner in the background. They could be running a keylogger, anything that you can think of. So what can be done about it? Pretty sad outlook, if you ask me. Now, if you look into the documentation of the Python pickle module, it very prominently says the pickle module is not secure only on pickle data you trust. This will execute arbitrary code during unpickling. So they're very clear what's happening right here. PyTorch itself in torch.load, they say warning, torch.load uses the pickle module, which is known to be insecure. It is possible to construct malicious pickle data, which will execute arbitrary code during on pickling. Never load data that comes from an untrusted source. Only load data you trust. So both Python and PyTorch are adamant about warning you of only loading trusted code. However, on Hugging Face, I was so far unable to find any of these warnings. Not that they would matter much, I guess most people wouldn't read them anyway, but it's simply nowhere. Okay, quick addendum to this video. Before releasing it, I've actually contacted Hugging Face and made them aware of the problem. And now there is a nice banner, nice warning in the Hugging Face documentation. I feel at some point Hugging Face is just going to be full of features they implemented because I did something stupid, but very appreciated. So there's now a warning and I'm going to be working with them to make things more secure, at least to share the little bit I know. All the while my model is being marked safe by their malware scanner, but their malware scanner is only just starting uh, to ramp up and it actually looks kind of promising that some of these things can be mitigated. So I'm looking forward to that. If you want to try out totally harmless model, feel absolutely free. It's available on the Hugging Face Hub. You're also free to use this library here to create your own funny models that do funny things on loading up. And in the spirit of responsible disclosure, I've actually contacted Hugging Face ahead of time here and warned them and asked them to maybe implement one of the suggestions. Again, there is very little that can be done other than awareness. So be aware, stay hydrated, and I'll see you around. Bye-bye.